I want, I want to finish off some things that we didn't get uh, to speak last week. And that is, last week we spoke about the, the plague of the wild animals. And there's one, there was actually a few aspects that we didn't get to speak about. One of them is from the Zara Shimson. So the Zara Shimson goes and brings down that there's a Midrash that says that really the Jewish people should have also been harmed in the plague of wild animals. So just for, as a quick recap, uh, there was a, uh, the makah of, of the wild animals was there were wild animals came from all, all corners, all different types of wild animals came and they attacked the Egyptians. The Midrash says that it also should be also the, the Jewish people. Why should the Jewish people also have been attacked by the wild animals? So the, the Gemara in Sotah goes and says that we know that there are, when you do a sin, when someone does a sin, there is a punishment attached to that sin. In this world, if there is a betin that, you know, if we have the Sanhedrin, we have the ability to put the punishment, so that comes into fruition. But what happens when we don't have the bet amigdash? We don't have the ability to go and have the Sanhedrin. We don't have the ability to put capital punishment, for example. So what happens if somebody violates a certain uh, commandment or a su, that the person does, and now that person is required a certain penalty? But there's nobody on this world to enforce that penalty. So what happens is, this is where the Bezdin Shalmala goes and takes into its, it, into its own hands. Where the heavenly court goes and mets out the punishment on the person. So if let's say a person will require a punishment of stoning, the way that it would go out, it, you wouldn't suddenly see like stones fall out of heaven with an with a arm, you know, like you know, 10 points if you get the head, you know, 5 points if you get the heart, you know, and, and just like throw out rocks from heaven. Rather, the why a death by wild animal means that that person was had a um, a punishment of stoning on their head. Now I just want to make a a clear announcement that if somebody, God forbid, gets hit or hurt by any wild animal for whatever reason, it doesn't necessarily mean be like, oh well, you know what had happened? <laughs> they must have they they deserve stoning. Yeah. So these are things that you don't say in a shiva house. Uh, but what you shouldn't take out of it is like if something happens and it must be I know the reason why because this is there could be many many reasons many calculations that HaKadosh Baruch Hu goes and has and we only know a small 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 fraction of a small 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 little iota of understanding like small 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 understanding of that so we can't know why things happen and where things happen but the punishment for stoning will be death by wild by, by animal attack or something of, of those likes so says the Midrash, the Jewish people were, had the punishment of stoning on their head. What was the reason that they deserved to have the punishment of stoning? The answer, the reason is, is because they also violate the Isu of Avodah Zarah. They also committed idolatry. And if someone commits idolatry, the punishment for that is stoning. And now you don't have it, so now you have the punishment would be would be wild animals. So really the Jewish people should have also been harmed by wild animals. And we see that what that the Jewish people were not harmed by wild animals. The Tzohamal goes and brings down a commentary on the Zohar, goes and says that the Ten Commandments is parallel to the Ten Plagues. The fourth of the Ten Commandments was wild animals. What is the fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments? Anybody know? Shabbat. Shabbat, very good. It was you have to keep, you have to keep Shabbat. There, the Gemara on Shabbat says something very, very interesting. If somebody goes and keeps Shabbat, then they get a kapara, they get an atonement for what? They are forgiven if they did, if they worship the Vodazara. Meaning that Shabbat has the ability to atone on idolatry. So we have over here that the Jewish people really deserve to be hurt by wild animals. Why? Because they were deserving a punishment of stoning. But there was no betting, so they had to be through wild animals. But the Jewish people kept Shabbat. So if they kept Shabbat, that saved them from the wild animals. And the Dubna Maggid goes and brings down, of Nachman Salzer goes and brings down the story from the Dubna Maggid, that there was, once a, there was once a poor man. And the way that he would make his money is he would travel from town to town and collect, and collect money. One time he reaches a certain town, and generally when you go and you're collecting money, you go to the, to the richest part of town first and then you work your way down, you know, from there. He knocks on this, uh, you know, very, very big mansion and the owner opens up and he says, you know, I'm coming from a certain town, I'm here to collect charity, I don't have any money for my family, for my kids, for my, you know, grand, whatever it was, the whole story. And the rich man goes says, wait a minute, where are you from? Which town? And he says, oh, I'm from uh, Lemberger, Steinberg, whatever, you know, like some town in Poland. And he goes, he's like, wait a minute. He says, you know, I used to live in downtown. Oh, my whole family lives in that town. He's like, maybe do you know my cousin, Mr. Stern? 
And he's like, oh, of course, we'd have it in the same shul. He's like, you know my cousin, so you probably know my, my, my uncle also. And he says, my uncle, and he's like, yeah, of course I do. And he's like, wow, that's, that's unbelievable. And he's like, the, the poor man is like, listen, you know, I'd love to sit and chat, but you know, I, I gotta go, I'm here just to collect charity. And the wealthy man goes and says, listen, you're here to collect for, uh, for the day, right? And he says, yeah. He says, how much do you expect to make during this day? So the poor man was, you know, looking at the houses, calculating, doing his, mathema <laughs> ma you know, his mathematical equations, and he rounded it up, you know, a few zeros, and he gave him a certain number. And the wealthy man says, listen, he says, I will give you the full amount if you come to my home and I will ask you the questions. I have a lot of questions about my family. I haven't seen them in a very long time. Please let me go and let me, uh, let me hear how my family's doing and I'll pay you for your time. Everything that you would have made, I'll cover. So how can you say no to that? You don't have to work and make all the money. He says, not a problem. And the rich man says, not only that, you'll enjoy this for dinner. You'll eat, the, you'll eat, food, you'll eat food over here. You'll drink the wine, you'll drink the scotch and we'll, you know, you, you'll tell us about the, our family. So he sits down for the dinner, and one course after comes out, the guy is gobbling down, never saw so much food in his life. And the rich man says, what are you doing? He says, that's just, you know, that's just the appetizer, just to get your palate wet. He says, we still have another five courses coming. And he is coming and with food after food, and this guy is wolfing it down, putting it in his pocket, saving it some spaghetti for later. This guy is just taking everything in. And finally, he finishes, you know, as between bites, he's talking to this, uh, you know, to the owner of uh, this wealthy man, telling him about his, uh, you know, what's going on back in his town. And eventually, they finish the, the finished meal. He says, you know, let's take this to the study. I have a lot more questions I want to ask you. He says, yeah, sure, not a problem. They go to the study. Meanwhile, you know, the owner pours himself a nice little glass of scotch on the rocks. He goes, he says, you want something to drink? He says, Brumfin, of course, why not? Let's take some drink. And he takes, he takes, starts taking L'chaim. Meanwhile, this guy is drinking, they're talking, and he's never eaten so much in his life, this poor man. He's never drank in so much good stuff in his life. Me, you know, so his soul wants to go up. He wants to you know, go into the dream world already, and his, you know, it keeps on talking, and you know, you're talking to somebody, and you know, you're getting tired, and I don't know if you've ever had this. Have you ever had somebody talk to you and you fall asleep on them? Yeah. Oh, you have? Okay, I guess I'm speaking to a woman. <laughs> 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 happens to be happened to me once in my life. It happened before I was married. I was speaking to one of my closest friends, and I, I, just, I had not, not a long day. I had like a long year or something, right? It was like a very tired. I was very tired, and you know, he was like talking to me, and I was, I was listening. You know, I, I was there. My eyes were open, but the next thing I remember is my alarm waking up in the morning, and I had no recollection of where I, you know, where I got cut off at, at which point in time. Kinds of remind me. So I, I tried when I go to sleep. I try you, you, when you fall asleep. You're supposed to be thinking of Torah. So if, you know, I have things that I'm middle of working on, so I think about that. If not, I try to put a Torah lecture in my, in, you know, to listen to it while I fall asleep. And sometimes I fall asleep and then I wake up, but I'm still listening to something, but I don't remember that I fell asleep. So I'm like, what is this person speaking about? I have no <laughs> idea what's going on. So that didn't happen. Is, I just completely fell asleep. And my friend was so upset. He's like, he's like, you know, you fell asleep at me like last night. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I don't even know. I don't even know how to apologize for that. Like, I, you know, like, are you boring? I, I don't know. I was tired. <laughs> I didn't even know where to go from this. But the, this poor man, he was going into the night. He was so tired and he was dozing off. And the rich guy kept on snapping his fingers, you know, like trying to wake him up. And he's like, you know, Rabia, like, you know, we're, we're, we're talking over here. And he's like, yeah, 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 you know, I'm sorry. And he keeps on falling asleep. Finally, the wealthy guy goes and says, listen, we had a deal. He says, I'm giving you the money for, the, for, for your whole day. I gave you food, I gave you drink, I gave you everything. The least thing you could do is you could sit up and talk to me. Says the Dibna Magid. Hashem comes to us. He gives us everything the entire week. He comes to us on Shabbat. What is Shabbat? Shabbat is a time between us and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's between us that we have a time that we can connect to God. And then what happens? We eat five courses, we wolf everything down, we drink a little bit of scotch, we drink a little bit of wine, and then we go like, and we're falling asleep. And meanwhile, Shem is over there and be like, I gave you everything. I gave you everything. All I asked you is just to talk to me a little bit. Maybe learn a little bit. Maybe dive in a little bit longer. Maybe do something. And now again, I'm not saying you shouldn't sleep on Shabbat. Of course, you're supposed to sleep on Shabbat. You're supposed to rest on Shabbat. But a little bit we could give to Hashem on Shabbat and go and say, listen, okay, you gave me so much. Let's talk a little bit. Let's go. Let's learn something. Let me talk to you. Even if you can't learn. So you talk to Hashem. You say something. You have some, some, some sort of communication. When you look at Judaism as a whole, there's two major parts. Doesn't, uh, um, you know, separate it, but there's two major parts. One is the ethical part. And one is the ritual part. So the ethical part is you talk about things like do not murder. Uh, I was going to say do not kill, so don't do that either. None of those two things. Uh, do not, you know, um, 
commit adultery, do not steal. These are ethical, moral, uh, you know, you know, ideas behind uh, Judaism. What you have to keep. Then there is, then there is also a a ritual aspect of it. You're talking about the Yom Tovim, holidays, Pesach, Shavuot, you know, Yom Kippur, there's, there's ritual parts, there's Tefillin, there's Mezuzah, there's, there's these ritual, ritual parts. But there's one ritual part that sticks out above the rest, and that is Shabbat. If you realize, Shabbat is the only ritual that's in the Ten Commandments. Yom Kippur is not there, Shabbat is the only one, the rest is all ethical and moral, ethical moral laws. There's Shabbat that sticks out over here. And it's something very interesting. What is a count? If someone desecrates Shabbat, doesn't keep Shabbat, what is it counted like? It counts, it counts like a guy, exactly, but there's even more than that. It counts as if you worship the Vodah Zarah. I don't know if you're with me so far, where we're going through, you know, with this. We said that the Jewish people were required to go and get, to get, to get, uh, you know, to get stoned, to get killed by the wild, hurt by the wild animals. But they got out of, why? Because they, can, they did a what? Avodah Zarah. But what gets, what takes rid of Avodah Zarah? That's Shabbat. And what happens if you don't keep Shabbat? That also goes back and forth. That's if you worship Avodah Zarah. You don't have to understand, like we even to begin to understand why. The, when we keep Shabbat, why is Shabbat so important? If you ever realize, people think there's different fractions to Judaism. There is Orthodox, there's modern Orthodox, there is conservative reform, and anything else that goes, you know, fo follows their footsteps. Really, there's really two difference in there's two different categories in in, in Judaism in, for Jews in Judaism. That is, one is Shomel Shabbat, and one who's not Shomel Shabbat. That's really how we classify Jews. Yes, of course, there's different cl you know classifications of where you're holding and which you know position you you are you know vis-a-vis -vis your spiritual growth. But when you break it down, there is two things. There's Shomel Shabbat and there's not Shomel Shabbat. Shabbat is so important that the, 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 one of the backgrounds behind it is that we know we keep Shabbat. Why? Because Hashem created the world in six days and He rested on the seventh day. So we too work for six days and we rest on the seventh day. So why is that such an important aspect of, of Judaism? When you go and you say, you know what, I believe in Hashem. So it's very nice, that's your mouth talking. When you go and you tell your spouse you love them, that's very nice, that's your mouth talking. But there's more to it when there's action to it. What is it, little actions speak louder than words? Mm -hmm. Or put the money where your mouth is, put your mouth where your money is, whatever those yeah. is, right? So there's things that come where if you say something, that's nice. But if you do something, that's a whole nother level. So when we go and we say, we believe, we think, we understand, that we know that God created the world. That's great, that's awesome, that's amazing. But how do you know that you really take that? Where is that action? That's when you keep Shabbat. When you keep Shabbat, that means that you are testifying that God created the world. Because it's not just, oh yeah, this is hypothetically what happened, what I know in a theoretical aspect of Judaism. No, 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 we take it to the practical level. We go and we keep Shabbat showing that we testify just like Hashem created the world in six days and rested in seven days. So too I believe that that happened. And how do I know that? I'm putting it into action. I am not working on Shabbat. Shabbat is where you take that belief in, in God and put it into, into reality. What happens when you don't believe in that? That's, you know, atheism, where this is where it comes, you know, this is where we close the loop, where you see if you don't believe in that, that's where you, you believe in other powers, you believe in something else, and that's where Avodah come in. Now we can begin to understand when Moshe Rabbeinu goes over to Paro, and he goes and he says to Paro, I want to take the Jews out for three days to go and to sacrifice to Hashem. That's what Mo Moses came over to Paro and he says, I want three days. That's he didn't ask for permanent leave. He said, three days, that's all I ask for. The bloods, the, the bloods, the bloods and the crypts came, right? The blood, the plague of the blood came, the frogs came, the lice came, the wild, all these things, three, these came. Paro couldn't give them three days? It wasn't that they were leaving forever, three days? Why was Paro so adamant I'm saying, no, I'm not gonna let them go out for three days? Furthermore, you know what Paro said? Paro said, let the adults go. Leave the women and children over here. Like what makes such a, why was he so arrogant, so adamant about not letting the Jewish people out for three days to sacrifice? He said, oh, sacrifice over here, sacrifice in Egypt. That's what he was okay with. You want to know why? Says the Arab Elchanan Saratskin. He goes and explains what was Paro's mentality. He wasn't, he didn't have a problem, so to speak, of having the Jews leave for three days. If they wanted to go to the Yama Malat, the Dead Sea, to get a deep, tissue massage and a scrub and whatever it was to pamper themselves and he probably would not have any problem with that. You know where he had the problem? 
He didn't have the problem with the Jews leaving for three days. He had a problem with Jews sacrificing to Hashem. That's where he had the problem. He says, wait a minute. You want to go and you want to sacrifice to a God? No, no, no. I can't have this spirituality in my, in my business. Who knows what's going to you know, regenerate or generate from this, from this spiritual connection. He, was, he had one problem, one problem only, and that was against God. Me, Hashem, Hashem, Who is God that I should listen to him? Apollo had a problem against Hashem. He didn't have a problem against the Jewish people leaving. That's why. What did he say? He said, let the, let the old people go. The women and children, let the men you know, and the adults, let them go. Women and children stay over here. What will make a difference? Because Paul knew if the adults go, the men go, then okay, it's not going to be such a lasting effect. But if you take the women and the children, that's going to have a lasting effect for generations to come. Paul said, that I cannot have. And by the way, here we can see how important women and children are in, in Judaism. People think, you know, when you, when you deal in the Baal Tshuva world, where people are becoming, let's say, even it doesn't have to be Baal Tshuva, even the regular from world, you have, uh, and I'll give you an example. So you go to people, let's say, in, in seminary or, you know, or, or in high school, and they're learning the halachos of what you need to do. And they say, okay, you know, you have to learn it. What are you going to do if you don't? I'll ask my husband. That's what they all say. First of all, what about if your husband doesn't know about it? He says, I'm not going to marry that type of guy. I said, who says he wants to marry you who doesn't know that also? So when you go and you think, okay, what's the big deal? I don't need to know all these things. It's not going to make that much of a difference. And I just know the, the woman is so imperative, so important to growth of a Jewish home. Children also, who raises the children? It's the woman. If the women don't know what they're talking about, how could they imbue that into the children? The woman is so imperative, so crucial to Jewish upbringing. Paro knew that. Unfortunately, Jewish people nowadays don't know that. Where does a Jewish woman think that she's okay? As long as she keeps sneut, which is amazing and it's great. But what about everything else? What about your connection to Shem? What about your tefillah, your prayer? What about the way that you have the halachot of Shabbat, the halachot of kashut in the kitchen? What about if speaking to your children about Hashem? Like, where does this come in? Oh, no, that's for the, that's for the rabbi and that's what we pay for the teachers. Oh, no, that's for the father to speak about. No, when it comes from a mother, it comes from a different place. Paro knew that. Paro said, this I can't have. The woman and the children, no, they got to stay. Adults, yeah, you could go. Or he said, you know what, do everything in Egypt. Why did he want to do everything in Egypt? He said, Egypt was such an immoral place. It was so full with Tuma that he said, yeah, you put some spirituality in here, it's not going to seep in. I don't know if whoever here has been to, to Eretz Yisrael, to Israel, when you go, when you go to grow and learn in Israel, it's a different growth. No? Yeah. So it's, a yeah. different type, it's a different type of growth. Why? Because it's a pure land. Even though, unfortunately, there's, you know... Even in Yerushalayim, the Ira Kodesh, there is plenty of Tumah that's unfortunately you know, creeping in over there. But even so, Israel has a different Kedusha. So when you learn in Al Israel, you have a different level of a Kedusha. You learn in Egypt, and you learn in, in, in Mir and Yerushalayim over there, or you go to the Kotel, it's a different level of a Kedusha. So Paul said, okay, you want to grow, you want to, want to sacrifice? Sacrifice right here. Why do you have to travel three days? He didn't want him to travel, to travel three days. But Moshe Rabbeinu says, no, 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 no. He says, the men, women, everybody's got to go. Because just like Paul thought about this, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu says also, we want to grow a Jewish nation. It has to be with the women and children. It has to be in a makom kedusha. It has to be a place of holiness. So it's also, when you're looking to, to uh, a lot of people now, you know, preaching to the choir, I'm speaking to myself, but, you know, are, are making a mass exodus out of Brooklyn. You have to think about where you're going. They're going to, well, Exodus, I guess is a <laughs> sensitive word, but I'm saying they're, they're leaving Brooklyn and they're going to different areas, either New Jersey, Connecticut, Florida, Texas, all throughout the, you know, uh, you know diff different places. Ever since the pandemic hit, people realized they could work from home, so people are traveling, going more to um, suburban areas, which is great, which I think is amazing. I mean, yeah, you know, whatever. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> but you have to think about where are you going? Is it the place? Is it going to affect your, affect your children? It's going to affect you. People think that they don't get affected by it. I have people that, you know, that, that I've spoken to, especially, let's say, for example, men. I say, you have to be careful. You have to watch what you're looking at. No, it doesn't affect me anymore. I'm like, look at this level over here. You know, you have, you have the gdole ado that, that are so nervous of what they're going to get affected by. But here, you, who learned about six hours in your whole life, you know it doesn't affect you anymore. So do you know what that means? That means that you're so desensitized that it doesn't affect you anymore. As you have people, let's say they're, they're, uh, you know, they're doctors. The first, the surgeons, the first time they have to cut someone open, they are passing out, unless they enjoy it, which is another problem. <laughs> but they are passing out. And they're so, the, the, every cut that they make and there's blood falling out, they get, you know, like, it's a different world. But what happens after your thousandth surgery? You're doing it like you're opening up pineapple. 
<laughs> you're cracking the ribs open just like you open up that. You're doing, you're taking, you're moving this hard and you're taking all the, whatever it is that you're doing the stance and you're doing everything without any problem. Why? Because you become desensitized to it. So, so too we, we could also become desensitized to things and that's why maybe, you know, it, it you know, it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't bother us, bother us so much. But the importance, the importance of going to a place of Kedusha, Paro knew that. The importance of having the Jewish family, a Jewish woman that knows what she's talking about in Judaism, uh, the children that, that, that will be connected to that, Paro knew about that. So we too should at least learn what Paro knows. And Paro knows this is important, so so too we should begin to understand. Moshe Rabbeinu knew, and Moshe Rabbeinu says no. We got to leave Egypt, because it's a place of Tumah, and we got to take the men, women, and, and children. So, meanwhile, when, when the plague of wild animals finished, Paro promised that he's going to let the Jewish, Jewish people go. What he promised, whatever it is, doesn't matter what he promised, but he said that he's going to let the Jewish people go. After the plague finished, as soon as it stops hurting, the, the boo-boo stops hurting, you forget, your, you forget your promise, right? You're sitting over there, and let's say, I don't know, something is bothering you. Let's say somebody drank way too much. And they're praying to the porcelain god, which is known as the toilet. And they're giving <laughs> sacrifices from their insides into this toilet. And oh God, you know, like, oh God, you know, and they're praying, like, I'm never going to drink again in my life. You know, I'm never going to do this again. You know, you hurt your hand. Oh my gosh, I'm never going to go, whatever it is that you hurt yourself doing, I'm never going to sew again because, you know, I just keep on cutting myself. Whatever, I'm never going to cut vegetables. Thank you, English. <laughs> Because, you know, I don't know, it just keeps on going to the fingers. And the second that you get healed, or the second that you get hungry, or the second that you get thirsty, or the second that your alcoholism comes, kicks, kicks back in, you forget about all the pain, all the horror, all the suffering that you had. So Paro, as soon as everything went away, all of a sudden, he forgot about all the pain and troubles that, that he had over there. So Paro didn't keep his word. What's interesting is at this point, after the wild animals, Paro didn't come to his, to his magicians and say, you know, can you duplicate this feat? Because until now, Paro was the, what is it called? Capital of Hogwarts, right? Paro was the highest level of magic camps, whatever, you know, anonymous, you know, <laughs> incorporated. They were the capital of magic land. And Paro would say, okay, like it must be a magic feat. And they kept on, you know, having the magicians come and try to go and prove that they could do the same thing. But after the Makav Kinim, after the Makav lice already, they saw that the Paro saw that his uh, magicians were subpar, at least compared to Moshe Rabbeinu, if it was magic. Then he stopped. He, they didn't even bother, uh, you know, calling him, uh, you know, calling them anymore. He was done with the plague, and he was not letting the Jewish people go. Now comes where we're coming for today is the Makah of Devil of pestilence of uh, the death of the of the animals. So after Paro reneges on his word, he goes and he backs out of his word. Hashem goes over to Moshe Rabbeinu and tells Paro, warn him on, another, uh, on the next plague that's coming up. And when, the, let's say for example, the, the Makah of frogs, Paro said, I'll let the Jewish people out tomorrow. The Makah of wild, of wild animals, I'll let the Jewish people out tomorrow. Now Hashem says, tomorrow is going to come the Makah of the, of the pestilence of the devil. Now what is this tomorrow so important? Says Rav Zalman Saratskin. You know, there's a very big lesson that we learn over here. And that is that the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot, and also the Gemara in Shabbat goes and says that when should you do tshuva? A day before you die. The problem is you don't know when you're going to die. So that's why you have to do tshuva every single day. <laughs> because maybe tomorrow you're not, not asleep. maybe tomorrow someone's going to die. So that's why you have to go and you have to do tshuva every single day. And that's why. When do you go, let's say somebody is, is being led to, to capital punishment, death penalty. When do they go and say, start starting them to, to go and do the, the vidui, do the tshuva? when they start walking, when they're getting very close to the execution. Why are they waiting so close? Because until then, somebody thinks, you know what? Maybe I'll get acquitted, maybe I'll get out, maybe I'll do this, maybe I'll get out. But once you see the guy sharpening his blade, once you see the noose over there, that's when you know it's game over. That's when you say, okay, now do we do it? Now it's gonna, now it's gonna come a, a different type of, uh, of tshuva. When we look at the makah, the plague of of pestilence, of, of devil, which is literally speaking the death of the animals. You think about it like, why is this a big deal? You know, like, why do we care? <laughs> like, oh, you know, like, you got, you, you got, got hit with blood. You know, like, oh, that is a cool plague, if we can say that, right? Frogs, right? The, when we spoke about frogs, that's like, that's like crazy. Even lice, you know, that's like really, wild animals, forget about it, right? That's Hollywood in the making, <laughs> right? So you have all these things, and then you're coming, be like, you know what's coming up next? 
Scooby is gonna die. <laughs> Betsy is gonna die. All your animals are gonna die. And, no, no, all the animals are gonna die. Like, why is that something? You ever think about this? And in fact, when people get up to this, like, ah, you know, especially this to be their children, be like, and frogs, and one big frog came out, and then it came out, and then it spit out of the thing, and then it croaked, and went to them, and then it went out to them, and then jumped to the ovens. We have all the midrashim, we got it. Come to my car, devil. All the animals die. Next one. What are we up to? All right. <laughs> no, yeah, right there. But, like the, but there's something over here. What, this, is a, this is, what is this, the un, most underrated makah? This is the one that people probably know, don't speak about. Makat choshech, that has good mazal. People speak a lot, a lot about that. You know, the wild animals, people speak about. Frogs, blood, people speak about. Like, I don't know, maybe, I don't know. But when you come to Deva Pesla, it's, okay, fine, you know, passed out, everyone died, all the animals died, let's move on to the next thing. First of all, we have to understand, what is so important? Why was this a makah? Really, why was it a makah? So, we can't think of animals like we think about it today. Animals today are pets, nuisance, you know, they're hitting your walls where they shouldn't be, and they're in the zoo. And, you know, again, food. well, and food, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> so, the animals back then were completely different. It's not like what we have today. Animals back then, first of all, were used for transportation. They were used, uh, just to give you an example, so horses if you want to go fast somewhere, right? Camels for long distance. Donkeys to carry heavy loads. These were all used by, um, by you know, for, for transportation. In fact, Pao had, you know, there were regal horses. Have you ever seen a horse in real life? They're really tall, by the way. No, they're like really tall. And they have muscles, bold. they're majestic animals. And if you get like a nice, beautiful, you know, horse, a white horse, right, with a horn coming, no, that's only yeah. <laughs> Well, you have a white, ho uh, you know, you have a white, beautiful horse, muscles coming, it's a majestic animal. Paro and any king back then, they didn't just have just regular horses, you know, pulling out, you know, together. They had regal, majestic, powerful looking horses. Paro, you know how some people buy cars now? Not for them, for the other people, for the neighbors. Especially when I used to live in Brooklyn over here. And you, uh, um, there, there are people there, they put the speakers. Have you ever seen this? The speakers are not on the inside of the car, they're on the outside of the car. And I'm, uh, I'm like, who, what, how do, you know one of those speakers that you drive past by? They put stickers on the outside. For the other people or something like that. Yeah. It's the cars that when they drive past by, all the alarms of the other cars, <laughs> yeah, go off. The dead people wake up, you know, like, it's like, the mufflers are, you know, like, just to make sure that everybody knows I am coming down over here, right? This is where they take uh, 1995 Honda Civic or something like that, and they put $500 million into it. There's lights going to the beats on the bottom. <laughs> the wheels are made out of nails, you know, and uh, the inside is like, interior design is just, you know, animal skins from the previous Maca. It was like a crazy, like, situation. Why do people buy those type of cars? Not because I like the way it drives. No, because it's from 20 years ago. Why are you buying a car for 20 years ago and putting $20,000 into it? Rather, because you want to soup it up. You want to make it look, you want to put the flames. I don't know if people still do that. You want to put that line across. You want to put the, you know, an engine that you could beat a cop in case they ever chase after you because you're drag racing. <laughs> whatever it is that you're running away from your drug dealer, whatever it is that you're doing, you're going and you're putting, why, what is it for? Why are you buying all this? Not for me. For other people, that's what I want to buy. And now granted, you want a nice car, fine, that's not a problem, you buy it for yourself. But some people buy for the other people. Paro, when he's buying horses, does it matter to him? It wasn't the horses didn't change the shocks on the wagon, that they didn't have shocks back then, right? They had regular horses. Why, why do they have beautiful horses? Because, oh, here's Paro, here's the regal chariot, it's coming in, the regal Bentley is coming through the stretched, you know, uh, horse carriage that he had with the four horsepower, whatever it is that he had going through it. This is what represented his power, his, his regalness. This also, all his horses died also. All his regal majestic, it's not like, okay, you think about it, okay, so now I can't go to the zoo for until they replenish the horses. No, this is something that they use as transportation. They also used it in, in war. We know horses are used in war. Elephants are also used in, you know, in certain areas for, for war. And additionally, how did they get communication? You can't send an email. You can't go to the USPS to go and send to, to, in snail mail. You go and you have a carrier. Go to, a guy with a horse would go, they would write it on the scroll. They would usually read it like this, here ye, here ye. I don't know if they did that back then in whatever, in Egyptian. And they go around and this way would travel through horses. Communications, the way mail was sent was through, was through horses. Orders were sent through other areas of the country through the horses. Further that, if you wanted to work, you have a question? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so you said, so with all the other makos, did it happen all around the world also? No, 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 only, only Egypt. Oh, only in Egypt? All the makos, only in Egypt, yeah. All the animals died in Egypt? Only in Egypt, yeah. Oh, okay, fine. Yeah, yeah. So, 
the, uh, the only the only difference was if when you deal with that uh, with uh, is according to a certain shot regarding the splitting of the seat. That's there's uh, yeah, there's different that right. So that's a, there's a certain shot like that. But but the makot no, that was only in in Egypt. Uh, when you look at the, how they work their fields, what are the majority of, of jobs that is that involved in Mitzrayim? That was agriculture. Where, what did the, what, who, who worked the fields? You had oxen that were pulling this. You had different animals that were worked for plowing. Different animals that were worked for 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 different things that you can't just do by human by human hands. Further, that they used to worship animals, right? We know they used to worship the ram. The ram was their was their god. So. You have that, and then you have the food, the sheep, the goats, the cows, all the, the, the there, was no, there was a shortage of milk, there was a shortage of wool. So you think about it, we don't understand it, because nowadays you'd be like, oh, all the animals died, right? So all your neighbor's dogs died, and all the cats died, and the squirrels, and the pigeons. Okay, how does that affect me? That doesn't affect me. So we don't realize the effect of this makkah. This, this makkah was built, it took Egypt on its knees. It the economy was crushed. The, you know, people's livelihoods, people's food sources were all crushed. Now, how are you supposed to go and plow a field now without any ox? You're gonna go and strap on this, you know, this, this heavy, crazy thing that an ox could pull and you're gonna try to walk with it? You'll walk in one spot, you'll just keep on digging a hole. <laughs> so, if you think about it, imagine that nowadays, no transportation, there's no gas, no cars, no buses, there was no bikes back then, so no transport, only walking. And no communication. That means no food. I don't know why I said no food, I just jumped up. No communication means talking. I don't know, unless you talk to your food. Nowadays people take pictures of their foods, but uh, you guys didn't even get it. <laughs> All right. So uh, no communication. They wouldn't be able to go and communicate with other people. They couldn't go and send letters to other areas. They had, whatever you are, that's all you knew. Your zip code, that's it. You don't know what was going on out of it, unless somebody physically walked through it. You also, you know, had a shortage of food. You didn't have the ability, unless you eat the animals, uh, you know, that died. Which is interesting to think about it, because if they died from a pandemic, then maybe the uh, maybe the meats were diseased. I, I didn't see this inside yet, but I was thinking about it, because they died from a from a there, there was a there was an uh, you know a pandemic with the, with the animals. So the animals died from a certain disease. Did the Egyptians now eat from that diseased animals or not? So it's a good question. But, uh, you know, it's, probably not. But. In any case, we see that it was a very, very severe, uh, you know, attack onto um, onto the Egyptian economy, onto the Egyptian people, and onto um, uh, you know the, just just the well-being of the of the uh, of the entire Egypt. So when we um, when we started speaking about the the Makot, we said that every there is ten there's ten Ma'amarot, there's ten sayings where God created the world. So the saying where this corresponds to is in, in Bereshit chapter 1, verse 14. It says, Vayomer Elohim, and God said, Himorot Beraki Hashemayim. There is going to be luminaries in the, in the sky. Lahavdil ben Hayom ben Alala. There's going to be a luminary between the day and night. And the, uh, the reason for that being is, I believe, the morale. The morale goes and says that, the, what does that have to do with the, the, the pandemic? Happens to be that it uses also the same Lashon. That with the Pasuk over here, it used the word Lamoadim. And when it uses the when it, when the pasuk in Shemot chapter nine verse five speaks about the makkah of devil, it says it says Vayasem Hashem Moed Hashem made a certain you know appointed time. So there is the same word Moed and Moadim used in Bereshit and Shemot with the same the same uh, the same verbiage that is used. But the Ma'ala goes and explains that the the, the luminaries they, they they affect the state of the ear and the way the diseases are spread is is also through the through the ear and that's what caused the you know the pandemic. So the next day, as Hashem promised, the next day the entire, all, in, in an instant, the pandemic didn't have to take a, a long amount of time. In an instant, all the animals died. So one moment, imagine that. Imagine just like, picture that scene. You're in a zoo, let's say, right? Because I, I don't know where other place you'll have a lot of animals. You're in a, you know, unless you're a shepherd, okay. right? So, <laughs> well, again, so you're a shepherd. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> so imagine you're in a zoo where you're looking at a bunch of animals. You're, you're in the middle of the zoo and you're looking everywhere. And then in one second, everyone, like just like shut off button, you know everyone you know goes down. That's how it was entire Egypt. In one moment, everything just fell down. Everything just and by the way, the, even though this directly affected the animals only, it also had a spillover effect on the people as well. Because let's say somebody was riding a horse, somebody was riding an elephant, someone was milking a cow, right? Have you ever done cow tipping? <laughs> that fell on you. So you're, the person's milking cow, the cow crushed. So people died from this thing per leg as well. You have a horse running at top speed, which whatever it is, and then all of a sudden falls down dead and you know, starts rolling on top and people got trampled also in this, in, you know, in this, uh, in this matter. Additionally, if the people that were wor working very, very closely with the animals also caught this disease, whatever the pa the, this epidemic was. 
So the way that an epidemic usually works is that it affects, it affects everybody around. But in this scenario, in this situation, this in this, in this makam, only the Egyptian animals died. The Jewish animals did not die at all. Meaning that if you had in one pen, you had 10 Egyptian donkeys and one Jewish owned Egyptian, Jewish owned donkey. Okay. You have 10 Egyptian owned donkey, <laughs> one Jewish owned donkey. The 10 died, the one Jewish owned donkey stayed alive. And this is something that, that's, it's miraculous when you think about it. Imagine you're back at the zoo, and everybody dies, and then one monkey is sitting over there scratching his head, and just looks around, and everybody's gone. And you say, you know, what's going on with this monkey? He says, oh, Mr. Schwartz owned this monkey. <laughs> he lent it to the zoo, just like our, you know, people do. You know, he lent it to the zoo for the day. And that is, it's, it's something that's unbelievable when you think about it. You have a bunch of birds flying, and everybody drops down, and like two of them start, you know, still flying around. Why? Because those are Jewish-owned parrots. So whatever it is, that, that whatever animal it was, it was something that was only by Jewish people stayed 100% alive. Even if it was sick. If, let's say, you had a Jewish animal that was on the verge of death, it, it became healed, it became stronger, and the Egyptians died, the Jewish animal did not die. So it com completely turned nature around. This is, um, you know, when, the, when COVID first started, like, not first started, even like, when it was just like thinking about starting, you know, like in the beginning, beginning of COVID, there was a certain speaker that came out and said, you know, people are asking him about, you know, this is a disease from China that's, you know, coming in, like, you know, should we be worried about it? Then he said something that I was like, oh, no, why did you say that? Oh, uh, you know, like sometimes people say to me, like, no, oh. Mm -hmm. Ay, well, it's not the he said that it's not going to affect religious people. What? COVID. Oh, and I was like, what? If a gadol adol comes and says it, Fine, take that to the bank. <laughs> you have a speaker. Uh, maybe he took it from here. Maybe this is where he got it from. The Nakat Dev, the Nakat has affected all the the uh, the, the you know the non-Jewish people, the Jewish people from Egypt, from Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Maybe we thought this was the Gula going out of uh, um, you know out of Galut, going back into the the you know Mashiach era. Maybe this is what it, I don't know. But oh my gosh, you know, instantly I was like, oh no, because you know what's going to be? Someone's going to hear that, and then a Jewish. We know many many Jewish people passed away. Many big rabbis passed away. So what, they weren't religious, they weren't religious, they weren't on a high enough level. Oh, you have to be so careful how you say. And I'm sure I say things that, you know, I shouldn't say very often. Um, mm -hmm. But I try not to, and like some, some, I remember it came, I remember right when he said it, I was like, oh no. And I actually, a few months later, I tried to see if I could find that video, if he took it down. Because if it would me, I would, you know, take it down quicker than, you know, <laughs> the first person that passed away, I would take it down immediately. <laughs> Um, but I don't think it was taken, uh, when I checked it, I don't remember who, I don't remember how to find it anymore, but it wasn't, it was still on months later while people, while Jewish people die. You have to be so, you have to be so careful of how you speak and what you say. But anyways, maybe that's where, he, this is where he came from. He said, the Makot in Egypt, they affected only the Egyptians and not the Jews. So maybe over here also, I thought it will affect only the, the Egyptians, the Egyptians, the, the Americans, the, the, the Chinese, everybody else except for the Jews. But unfortunately, that's not the case. And we do have to be very, very careful on, on what we, um, uh, you know, on what and how we say. The, and this is, by the way, oh, I'm going to get off tangent. It's so late. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, what could you do? So when um, you see something like that, is something I should speak to myself eternally. <laughs> These are things that I shouldn't say out loud. But, um, you know, when speaking about Mashiach, you know, uh, what was it, two, three years ago, maybe four years ago, we spoke, we had a very, very long series on Mashiach and all the details, uh, you, know, uh, you know, on it. And I refrain from speaking about the current events. You have certain people who speak very, very much about current events on how it's related to Mashiach. I don't like speaking about that. I generally don't like speaking about it. One of the reasons is, is because what happens is that you tell people, that's it. Pesach, this is Nisan, this is the Zman Geulah, this is the time of everybody for the redemption. So now we're going to get redeemed because we'll give you proofs and sources from this and proof sources from that, that it's the epidemic and the pandemic and, and everything now it's supposed to be that we're coming to, Mashiach's going to relieve himself, you know, reveal himself right now, and that, that's the end of everything. And then what happens? What happens if. It doesn't, it doesn't come. Now, again, we have to have every single moment. doesn't matter. Yes, you're supposed to. But when you're trying to tell people to prove them without a doubt and people that don't know so much about it, what's going to happen? It's a, what is it, a boy who cried wolf. You keep on spilling these things. Like, hey, you know, like I'm done. So I generally don't like speaking about. That's one of my main reasons I don't like putting in the, um, 
the current events into like the Mashiach, the, the Mashiach topics. Now again, you, if, you, if you're someone who's very learned, then you can understand, okay, this, what does it mean? It means that this is more an apropos time. This is a time that it's more likely that Mashiach could come. But people that are not so well versed on the Mashiach story, concept, or maybe basically in Judaism they hear a lecture, they think that's it. It's, it's supposed to, if it doesn't come by the end of Rosh Chodesh Nisan, that's it. Then maybe the Mashiach is not coming, Chas So you could get, you know, you have to be very, very careful on, on how you deal with it. This is how careful you have to be when you, when you speak. Uh, and that's why I, I, I like when people go and they tell me, if let's say I say something wrong, I want to know about it. I, you know, the, the, I, and I, I speak, sometimes I listen to a speaker or speakers and they say something that's wrong. I'm not going to go in, you know, be like, hey, brother, you know like, <laughs> what you said is really wrong. You know, it's not true. And the sources over here and the proof is over here. And you're not, you know, like it doesn't, but it happens to be that I'll, I'll make a public announcement. If I say something wrong, that it's not correct, I want to know because I want to make a, you know, a correction or take it down or edit it or whatever it is that, you know, that, you know, that, that needs to be done. We have to be so careful how we speak. That's when you're speaking in public. You're speaking in a, in a um, you know, to a virtual crowd, you're speaking to who knows where it could go. But it's also when you speak to your friends, you speak to your family, you have to be so careful. Words have such a strong impact. Such a strong impact. Anyways, going back to the Makkah, it's getting really late. Um, going back to the Makkah, Moshe, um, Paul goes, the entire, the entire Egyptian animal died instantly. Now, Paul didn't have any reasons to go and summon Moshe Rabbeinu and say, hey, by the way, pray to God that this will be over. All the other Makkah, Moshe had to pray to God. You know, please, Moshe had to go and pray to God based off Paro saying, please remove the plague because the Egyptians are begging, they, they can't handle it anymore. Now it was done. The moment that it started, the moment it was done. So there was nothing more to, to so Paro didn't even summon Moshe Rabbeinu. He didn't even need to go. He thought maybe that this was something that came from, you know, by chance. And he tried to say, like, maybe it was an astrological, you know, uh, manifestation of, a, you know, like, it affected only from the Egyptian astrology point. But from the Jewish astrology point, they didn't, and that's why it didn't. He had different, uh, uh, different reasons, different excuses that he, um, that he came up with. The, the final part of, point over here is that even though all the animals died, there was a small percentage of animals that still stayed alive. It was about 10% of animals that still stayed alive. Those are the animals that were put inside, generally speaking, because Moshe Rabbeinu said that if you put the animals inside, they were going to be spared. So the animals that were kept in, first of all, okay, well, no, we don't have time. Okay, so the only, the animal, it says we had 10% of animals that were, that, were, that were left. I still have a full night ahead of me. <laughs> that, uh, um, measure for measure, let's do the measure for measure. What is everything that HaKadosh Baruch Hu does? Everything that happens in our life is measure for measure. Nothing happens just because, you know, God was in a bad mood. Or, you know, again, you could cause problems upon yourself, but if it comes from Hashem, everything is measure for measure. So what was the measure for measure over here for this uh, Makkah? So number one, the Jewish people, they were shepherds for the Egyptians. And they constantly made them look after the animals. Oh, so you're making the Jewish people work for you for the look of the animals. Now there's not going to be anim any animals left. There's nothing more for the Jewish people to, uh, to, to work after, to, to look after. Additionally, they, the Egyptians monopolized the Jewish people's time with their cattle, their, uh, their, their herd, and their animals. So the Jewish people also had animals. But they weren't able to go and look after their own animals because they were too busy looking at the Egyptian animals. And their own animals died, they were neglected, they you know, unfortunately fell into uh, you know, despair. So now what HaKadosh Baruch Hu did is HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, okay, now you, you try to go and keep your animals alive, your animals over, and now you're not going to have any animals, and the Jewish people will have animals. What happens if, let's say, a Jewish people, a Jewish person went and took, you know, 400, uh, you know, sheep out the pasture, and one of them got lost, or one of them was eaten by the wolf, or one of them, you know, fell off a cliff? The Jewish person had to pay out of his own pocket back to the Egyptian. So the Jewish people had to pay for that. Now they're not gonna. Now they they lost all the animals that they uh, that they have. Also, the Egyptians would would go and tell the the Jewish people, go pasture these animals. So imagine you have to walk. So let's say you go to from here to Ocean Parkway. There's a nice field. You're talking about when there was grass in Brooklyn, right? So in front, there's a nice field, go over here, and that's where you're gonna, that's where you're gonna pasture animals. But the Egyptians would say, no, no, no. Says, you wanna pasture my animals? I don't want it from here. Go to Farakaway, walk to Farakaway, right? There was no trains, there was no cars. Go to Farakaway, and that's where you're gonna pasture. So the Jewish people would travel days to go and pasture the, and then travel back. So they were separated a long time from their families because of the animals. So the animals were the cause of it, now the animals, uh, you know, died. The, another reason was is that the Egyptians, Instead of going and having the ox plow the field, they would tie a bunch of Jews and say, now you plow the field. 
Instead of the animals doing the work, they made the Jews act like animals to do the work. So now the animals, Mida connected Mida, would uh, would die. This is what you have. You have very twisted, twisted. I, I, I don't. It, this is one of the things that get on, gets under my skin, where you have people that couldn't care less about human life, but when it comes to animal life, people oh. That's where I draw the line. You know, they don't care about murder or whatever it is. I, w w for the life of me, I cannot, you know, begin to, you know, to understand why there are businesses that are built on shampooing dogs and, and doing that when there are starving children, you know. Forget about in Asia, like over here, right over here. There's, there's, there's starving kids that can't, but no, we have to go and we have to fund research of why you know mice twitch sometimes when you hear a certain <laughs> sound. This is what this is where the big experiment. This is where it needs to be. So, the and who are like these? The Nazis. The Nazis would go and they would torture the Jewish people. They would murder. They would kill. They would brutally distort the Jew human life. But the dogs, the animals. Oh. No, that's for them, it's Kodesh Kodeshim. That's for them, it's the highest level possible. This is where they consider themselves a very, very high level. But the Jewish people, scum of the earth, not even lower than animals. You have the Egyptians, the animals, they cared about. The Jewish people, no, we don't care about. We need to take a break from our animals worked so hard, they need a day off. Jews, why don't you go and plow the field? So the Jews were treated like animals, like the, to save their animals. Now their animals died. Midah connected midah, they didn't have anything to save. Says Rabbi Victor Miller. We're almost done. Says Rabbi Victor Miller, the, um, there was something very interesting about this makkah that, that, that really, you know, I, I feel like this makkah really deserves more time and we're really rushing through it, but what can we do? The, Rabbi Victor Miller what, says, what happens when there is a magifah, there's a plague, there's something going on, where do people go? Nowhere. They stay, they're, they're stuck at home. So what do you do when you're stuck at home? Nowadays, unfortunately, we have way too much distractions in our house. There's probably less distractions outside the house than inside the house. But, ne but before technology came, before you had phones, computers, cell phones, tablets, and every other screen in your house, you were stuck at home. You had nothing to do. You would look at the walls, and you count the thread count of your pillowcase. You count the pillow, you know, you, you have no idea. You have no, what, what, but what happens? You start thinking. You start thinking. Says Rabbi Victor Meli, quotes the Silat Yishleim. This is one of the reasons why we fail to gain awareness of the greater things in life is that we're always preoccupied. We're always thinking about other things. Comes the Makkah, this, this plague, it was a pandemic, there was a disease going around, all the animals were dying, people were nervous. Where did people go? Well, they ran into their house. They ran in, they, they stuck into their house because now this is the part that they are going to be able to go and, and stay away from the disease. But now that they're stuck in the house, now they have a chance to think. They didn't have this, you know, they couldn't read the daily novel, it wasn't delivered. They couldn't go and they couldn't, there was no internet, there was no phones, there was no nothing. They were just them alone in their house and them along with your thoughts. This is the thing, like nowadays, we're so scared to be with our own thoughts that even when we're outside, we have to be listening to something. We can't stop for a second and think. Why, when was the last time that you stopped and thought? Not spaced out. That doesn't count. That's just your mind, you know, you know drifting off. When was the last time that you thought about something without any outside influence? When was the last time that you had a deep, Meaningful thought. When was the last time that you, that you really walked outside and said, you know what, let me think about my life. Let me think about where I'm going. Let me think about what I want from here. You know, I, I am, you know, X amount of years old. What am I going to do in five years? Where am I going to be financially, spiritually, marriage, you know, children? All these things, do we ever stop? Where do our thoughts usually come from spaced out stuff? Usually, it, you know, it goes into like, and then we, you know, takes us from like, you're thinking about opening up a business, within 30 seconds you're a multi-billionaire, mm -hmm. and uh, then you circle around to like, okay, now I have no money, and now what am I gonna do? And then you're depressed, and then the rest of your day is done. Right? When is the last time that you think positively about what is going to change in your life? The Makkah says that Rabbi Victor Miller was so crucial for the Egyptians. It was so cru 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 crucial. Here, the, pa the, the Pasuk says, Hashem. What was the purpose? of going of all the makot that the Egyptians will know that there is a God. Now if there's so much stimulus throwing at them, they didn't have a chance to think. Come this makah and says, okay, now you're stuck at your homes. There's no hail throwing down and coming down on you. There's no wild animals. There's no octopuses ripping out your front door. There's no tigers in your backyard. You're sitting at home and you're thinking. And what do you think about that? What is happening over here? There's four makot that already happened. There's four plagues. What, who, what's going on over here? Maybe there is a God. Maybe I should stop, you know, worshiping the ram. Maybe I should stop worshiping the sun. Maybe there's something more that's to, to, to life. So this is the makkah, says Rabbi Victor Miller over here, that, that sort of put, put God on, uh, you know, had a chance of, of people to contemplate 
the fact of, the, the effect of God. So this is such a crucial my God that really just you know goes unnoticed when people just like you know skim through it. When you so, says Rabbi Fran brings something very beautifully. If you look at you know the way the Makot went, the way that the plagues went, Moses warned and explained what what the punishment was going to come. You know that this is you're talking about an expert level of like combat fighting. When you have, uh, I don't know if anybody ever took karate. So let's say you have a guy that's a black belt, I don't know, fourth degree, I don't know, whatever. And like all, all the kung fu's, jiu-jitsu's, krav maga, and everything else that was made up after that from anywhere from Shanghai, you know, to the Middle East, everything, they covered it the entire life, right? And they're there, and they're show, and they're, you know, how does someone who knows everything gonna, you know, show off his talent? It tells you exactly where he's gonna hit you. He's gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fake you to the right, I'm going to fake a punch to the right, then I'm going to hit you a jab to the left, I'm going to do a roundhouse to your back, and then I'm going to jump on top of you, and you're going to die. And that's the way that, you know, like, punch by punch, exactly how it's going to go. Why? Because I am so good, the guy is saying, that I could tell you where I'm going to hit you, and you still can't do anything about that. Hashem goes and says, this is what I'm going to do. There's going to be a plague of blood. There's going to be a plague of flaws. There's going to be a plague of wild animals. Hashem warned them exactly of where they're going to do exactly. And what happened? It came to the T. Every single thing that Hashem said came exactly to fruition. Moshe Rabbeinu goes and he was four for four. At this point, he was five for five. Everything he said was, was correct. Everything. So why is Paul saying, no, no I'm not going to send them out. No, not going to do it. Are you, are you uh, uh, on drugs? Like, what are you doing? How do you go and how do you see someone do something? Consen- and I'm, it's, Moshe Rabbeinu did do a car trick. And it didn't come out of Paro's wallet the whole time, you know, or like, you know, he cut open another frog and the ace of spades was right there. And that's the card that he saw. It wasn't a card trick. This is, you're talking about something that magic can't even begin. Even the magician said that this is Ezbal Okim, this is the God. So how is it possible? How is it possible that Paro did not send the Jewish people out? How is it possible he didn't get the hint? How is it possible he doesn't say... It's a very important aspect. It's a very common thing to speak about because you look at it and be like, it makes absolutely no sense, you know? It's literally God going be like, hello, hi, I'm God. Can you please? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I don't say anything. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> ah, la, 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 la. You know, like, are you ki-? Like, that's what really was going on. So, Rav Simcha Zissel Bright goes and says, you know, when you have a wicked person, they always look for a way out. They always look for something... Paul, he had all his animals, majority of his animals died, right? There was 10%, let's say, of the animals that were left in. But the Jewish people still had animals. So you know what Paul said? Okay, we don't have any animals. I'll, I'll figure it out. I'll buy my horses from, from the Jews. I could go and I'll take it from different, you know, from different areas. You know what the plague of frogs? It, the, the, the stench. The, the frogs died over there. It's interesting. For the wild animals, the wild animals all left. Why? Because they weren't... They, they, well, let me explain it the other way. The frogs died because the frogs were created specifically for the Makkah. So once the Makkah was over, they died. But the wild animals that came from all areas. Once the Makkah finished, they didn't eat them more. They, go, they went back. So the, and also God didn't want them to benefit from all the hides of all these animals. So the, the wild animals left. The frogs stayed over there. And it stunk. I don't know if you've ever smelled a live frog. Right? <laughs> what happens when a frog passes away? To, you know, goes into frog heaven. So... That's when you have one frog. But imagine you have a billion frogs. You know, all, all over Egypt just died. This, and Egyptians were very into fragrance. They, they had their perfumes, they had everything. All that was gone. All that, they couldn't, and they, you know what Paolo said? Paolo said, okay, you know what? Egypt is a very big land. We'll go move to a place where it doesn't smell so bad. Because there's always some sort of an, a way out. Sign after sign, a wicked person's not going to wake up. And we think about it, it's crazy. It's crazy how Paro didn't wake up. So like if you were in Paro's you know, you know, place, of course you'd be like, what, are you kidding me? I wouldn't even think twice. As soon as the blood came, you know, that's it, everybody, everybody out. But really, the truth of the matter is, are we really any different? Okay, maybe God doesn't send us 10 plagues. You know, uh, well, I, let's hope that, that it doesn't uh, happen. But Hashem sends each and every single one of us signs. And every single time, what happens when a sign comes? Either we ignore it, or... Be like, you know what? I should probably check my mezuzot. Yep. Yeah, I think that's the problem over here. No, Shabbat? No, that's not, that's not the issue. No, no. 
kosher? No, that's not the problem. In fact, that I haven't said Bilkat Amazon once in the past year with Kavanah. No, that's not it. You know what it is? It's probably the mezuzah that, uh, you know, that I got. That's where the problem, that's where the problem is. You know what? I'll say, and again, this is not a bad thing. You should. I'll say Sheol Shirim for 40 days straight. I'll go to the cult for 40 days straight. But to change my character traits? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'd rather pray. You know, like, let's leave it at that. You know, like, Hashem sends us a sign and be like, maybe we need to do something. You know, it's the, in the olden days, and I'm not talking about 50 years ago, right? The time when we had the prophets. If somebody got sick, if somebody had a problem, they went to the prophet and say, listen, I have this problem. What do I need to do? The prophet says, you got to fix your anger issue and that's going to go away. Thank you very much. Go and you work on your anger issue and it's done, the problem goes away. Nowadays, we don't have that. So we think about it, it's so much worse. It's so much more difficult. God sends us a, a something and we don't know what to fix because we don't know. But the truth of the matter is, this is the greatest blessing that we could have. Why is this the greatest blessing that we could have? Could fix everything. Very good. Very good. Because what happens? God sends you a little flick. Sends you a little flick. And be like, what? Why did I get that little flick for? Maybe it's because I didn't pray in a week. Oh, no, wait. Okay, so you pray for, you start praying. And be like, you know what? No, but maybe, maybe it's because I don't dress modestly. So then you start, maybe it's because I don't keep Shabbat properly. Maybe it's because I do, and you start, God gives you one little flick and he gives, and you fix 10 things, if you're smart. In the olden days, God would have to give you 10 flicks. And you have to go to the Navi, okay, now he fixes this, now he fixes this, now fix he fixes that. So now we have the ability, but what is that if you're able to read the signs? If you're able, again, we don't know how to read signs, but one thing we do know, and this is what I get, I, you know, I have people call me up uh, for dreams, for all of these. W one of the main things that I tell people again and again and again, so whether it was a real dream, whether it was a fake dream, uh, that's not the discussion of today, but at least do change something. Change something in your life, it'll be a merit, a schut. You leave here tonight, what are you going to do that's going to change something? I'm not saying you go and you change your entire life. One little thing, you can take a little step. I was speaking to um, a person this week, and uh, this person has a lot of difficulties. It, um, well, he brings upon himself, so I, I don't know if I can say it. Has a, a lot of temptations, a lot of temptations, like not normal level, like, <laughs> like a different level of temptations. And first of all, he told me his red eyes, he says, I enjoy it, I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to stop. And, I, and I'm like, I understand that it's, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're, it's, it's very enjoyable for you, but I'm not saying at least if you can't stop, so okay, fine, so you don't stop. Well, I shouldn't say that, you should stop, but I'm saying at least you can do one thing. You don't do it on Wednesdays or whatever it is. You do something, something. We're, we're a type of people that we're like, okay, uh, I'm not even going to start. What's the point? No, start something. At least do something. So you, you think that you can't stop a certain thing? Stop it for an hour. You can't, your, your, Lashonah is very, very hard. You, you just, it's, it, Gossip is your life. Let's say whatever it is, you can't do it. So Sunday from until midday, you don't do it. For 12, four hours, you could do it. Yes, you could do anything for four hours, generally speaking. And don't do it when you're sleeping. Or, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm not going to speak Russian. You know, like, do it when it counts. Do it when it, you, you have a problem with dressing, you know. So, so one day a week, you dress modestly. Something that you could do that you should take upon yourself. Take upon yourself something. So at least you show us, I'm here, okay, I'm starting. People have a, you know, well, I want to get a blessing from a, from a, from a capitalist. I want to get married. I'm, I'm like, okay, so that's great. You get it. But maybe do something. You know what's even, I can't say even greater, but, but something that's so powerful, an extra merit that you could do yourself. Take upon yourself something. Change something. You, we all know when we're honest with ourselves, even when we're not, we know because we lie to ourselves in our own mind, in our own conversations. They're like, yeah, no, that's okay. Like, really, it's a shalom bias for my future husband. You know, like whatever. Yeah, we all have the calculations and we know exactly what's going on. But if we're really honest, we take away our bias, we know what we need to fix. We know what we need to do. So, but we don't want to. Well, you know, like, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, I know, uh, yeah, like I can't. I want to want to want to do it, but I'm not, I'm not there yet. You know, like, uh, what do you think I am? You know, Reds, I, like, I can't, I just can't get to that. So okay, fine, so don't get to that. But at least start it. Do something. Do a percentage of that. Do something. You think that you're not going to be able to go for the guys, let's say. They can't finish the, the, the Gemara. They can't finish us. Okay, so instead of learning Daf Yomi, learn one page a week. Do something to show that you have the ability, you're starting, and that's a huge, huge schut. We come with so many issues in our lives, we don't realize how powerful it is when we just take a little bit, just something little, and change it. It's all about the baby steps. It's all about something that we can do. There's one caveat to this, I always have to say it, because baby steps are baby steps, and eventually you need to grow up and be either a big girl or a big boy, and you have to take the big steps. But in the beginning, and the beginning could be, Somebody could be religious to the highest level for 50 years. It could be a baby step in something else. And that's where you take small steps, but, but take that step. Take that first step, that little step. You have a hard time, and 
I don't know, wasting your time on YouTube or any other you know, website, excluding Torah anytime, right? You have any social, any social media. So let's say you go and you say, before I go to bed, I'm not going to look at my phone. Or, bef or better, or make it, let's make it even a little easier. I'll look at my phone until I lay down. Once I lay down, no more phone. That's something that's doable. You want to look, so now you have to get up and you have to go uh, um, you know, sit in the chair. Problem is now you might, you know, <laughs> people just fall asleep. Here's where you know you have a problem. If you keep on coming out in the morning with red you know, spots all over your head from the phone falling on your head every time you're, you're trying to scroll up and it falls down, that's when you know you have a problem. So take something. Take something small. Change it. Take that into the next level. Let's finish with one, when, with one, final, um, with one final thought. When, if let's say some politician goes through a scandal or a company goes through some sort of uh, um, fraudulent thing and, and it gets put out in the news, what happens nowadays? Nowadays, there are companies that are, th their specialty is, is th they do PR. They, they do damage control. So let's say this certain politician, a certain celebrity, did something bad. They are, hire companies now that go and sort of take that to different, like sort of transfer, so that people will stop thinking about what you, th you just did. That's why you have politicians that have gone through scandals and they still got reelected again. Why? Because they have these PR companies that come out and say, okay, forget about the fact that they swindle millions of dollars, but look, they built a hospital. Or, and they put the focus on somewhere else. So it's not like the people changed. It's not like the politician says, you know what? I'm a human being. I made a mistake. I'm not going to do it anymore. Maybe yes. Majority of the time they have the PR companies. They didn't change. They were able to just divert the, the blame to somewhere, to somewhere else. This is where the, you know, how, how the Esav. Esav, he, when, when, when um, he comes over to Yaakov and he says, give me, give me from the red beans. He wanted the lentils that, that Yaakov was cooking. What did, what did Yaakov, um, what did Yaakov, this foreigner goes and explains, how did Yaakov respond to him? He says, Esav, you're the only person that cares about it today. That's why Yaakov says, as of today, sell your birthright to me. Why as of today? Because says this foreigner, you care about what today only. You don't care about tomorrow. You don't think about the future. You think about right here, right now. Paul is thinking right here, right now. Right here, right now. Okay, I had to play yesterday, but right here, right now, I don't have a problem. I don't have to worry about it. We go and we, God sends us a, a sign, something that we have to fix. And then we're like, okay, we should really fix it. But a second as we stop throwing up, as a second that the blood stops coming out, the second that we stop feeling nauseous, all of a sudden you forget all your commitment. You're looking for a spot and you're saying, God, I will, please, I will be religious. If you just find me a spot in Brooklyn, I will sell my soul. Whatever it is that you, oh, I found the spot. Never mind, God, I'm good. You know, like, and you forget about it the second that that happens. This is where the saying, it was, I learned this, I actually, I, I think I've heard this before, but one of the first times that I was from Rabbi Fran, the, the terminology YOLO. You ever, you know what that is? I, you only live once. I, I heard about this before. I had my students, which I never understood what it was. The guys would, um, they were about to do something, but they would scream out, YOLO. And I, it, like, I, I thought it was maybe a Sephardi thing. I don't know. You know, like I, I wasn't, uh, you know, I wasn't that uh, familiar with my urban, what is it called? <laughs> my uh, urban uh, dictionary. Um, but Yellow is you only live once. You only live once. This is how the Sha'im do it. This is not the way that the Jewish people, oh no, that we only live once. So let's do whatever it is that we can. First of all, let's not get into the Gilgalim aspect. Let's get it. Okay, first of all, you know, but, but yeah, but you don't, what do you mean you only live once? So then you do whatever you want. This is why how people go, how wicked people go, and they decide that they're going to do a certain sin or they're going to do a certain, because what? You only live once. You only live once, so let's live life to the fullest. This is a way of a wicked person, a rasha, doing it. You eat, you, you drink, you be married. Now for tomorrow, you may die. How do we start off? No, 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 no. You, for tomorrow, you may die. The Jewish aspects do, do tshuva today. The wicked people, the, the secular world, it's YOLO. You only live once. So, why, so let's have a lot of fun now because tomorrow you may die. The Jewish people, yeah, you only live once. You better make sure you only live once. So you better do tshuva so that for, to, you know, for tomorrow. So we have to do tshuva. What is that? The, we have to put T-O-L-O, -O, whatever. Tshuva only live, on, whatever. Okay. <laughs> so, but the idea, the concept is, is that the, the lessons that we come out from the makot is so imperative, so important. Besides the fact that we should go and we should delve into it and we should really understand, we should really elaborate on the sadal, um, on, on the sadal this year. But even more than that, we should go and we should take out lessons that we could learn. And if there's one lesson that I could tell you from, that, that's such a powerful lesson, is the ability of self-contemplating, to go and think about it. Think about your own life. The, the Egyptians were put into their put own in homes. Cheshman and Nefesh. They were put into their own homes. And let me tell you a little secret. We were also put into our own homes. For over a year, we were stuck into our own homes. Because maybe Hashem is telling us, stop, think. 
Think about some, think about your life. But the problem is, is that we're stuck with all these stuff and we're stuck with the computer and we don't even have a chance to go and to think. So let's tell Hashem, we under, you know, we don't need any more signs. We don't need the pandemic, let it be gone. We don't need any more of the diseases. You know, we get it. Let's try, and maybe we can't. Maybe the technology has taken us to a point that we can't do it. If you could, then of course you should do it. But let's say you can't. Majority of the people are so hooked on it they can't. A little bit you could do. Before you go to bed, you could do it. Right? Maybe minimize it a little bit, just a little bit. Think for, to each one their own. There's apps now that you can do, uh, um, I don't know, screen time. I don't know what yeah. they're called. Like how much time. If you want to see a wake-up call, download that app. Where you'll be like, what? I spent 35 hours a day on this? I didn't even know there was 35 hours a day. You know, you're going and you're, you, know, you realize of where, how you know you have so much of a problem. If you're on social media more than five minutes a day, then I believe you have a problem. Well, what are you doing on social media? Like who, you have to hear like what other people are, are always, uh, uh, yeah, it, it, thank you. <laughs> Eating, vacations, whose birthday it is, who passed. This is where people get all the information anymore. And guess what? This is where they get the information also about, you know, healthcare, about the, you, because of course, social media, YouTube, this is the place where you, this we know is true. <laughs> Anyways, uh, with that, let's open up with questions. I think we have a question over here. Um, okay, we have one, qu one question over here. Um, oh, it might not be a question. But let me, let me message it, let me say it anyways. I personally enjoy thinking and would be so happy if I could spend much more of my time thinking. But most of my day, my mind is automatically preoccupied with other things, with work, with talking to others. There's barely any time left for thinking. Baruch Hashem for Shabbos, where I usually have more time for this. That, that is a great point. This is where we could tie in Shabbat. We didn't even tie in the Shabbat, because really it is. You could tie in also Shabbat. Shabbat gate, you know, is a time that you talk to Hashem, but you should also talk to yourself, not outside, because then, you know, you have a problem. But like inside your heart, you know, like, Think, contemplate, where am I holding in my life? What am I going to do if it, tomorrow is the last day on, my, on, on this planet? Did I live a life? Did I, am I where I want to be? And if not, then maybe I should make some changes. Oh, but I can't make those little changes. Okay, that's the last question on, on the other. Any questions over here? Yeah, one. Yeah. Um, what are, like, like Shir Hashir and all those things for? Like, so usually law. sometimes I feel like, yeah, all these Sigul law are in place for, because sometimes I feel like I work so much on myself and it's just not enough. So, the sugulot are, there, there is a great power to certain sugulot. Some sugulot have more, let's call it, sources than others. And it's great to do those things. And it's, and it's very, very powerful. For example, you go to the Kotel for 40 days straight. Uh, Shia Shim is also very powerful. There's also... Perek um, Shira. is also exactly right. There's a lot of things that are, that are great and they have power. We don't know where we're lacking. So, meaning that there might be one thing that we need to just like check off and then whatever we wanted to, we get to that. But we don't know what it is. So if you try one thing and it didn't work, it doesn't mean you'd be like, okay, well, I guess nothing works. No, then you have to go to the next one. And you should keep on trying, just like you have a doctor that has a patient over there. The patient's sick and the doctor prescribes a medication. The, doc the patient comes back, it's, you know, uh, not working. What does the doctor do? Be like, well, I'm sorry, <laughs> it looks like you're gonna die. <laughs> you know, like, it's not, yeah, I gave you Tylenol, I don't know what else to do. No, the doctor says, okay, now try taking this medication. That doesn't work, let's try running more tests. You keep on having to try. So if you're, you're diagnosing your problem, your spiritual problem, where you're holding, you wanna fix yourself. You did this, I'll show you, it didn't work, okay, now let me work on myself. Oh, this didn't work, and now let me work on myself in somewhere else. Many times we think we work on ourselves and we, how do we work on ourselves? People think we work on ourselves, okay, I know I can't, I shouldn't be angry anymore, so I'm not gonna be angry anymore, and that's it. And be like, that, that, that's not called working on yourself. And that could, what's working on yourself? You understand what anger is. You have to start learning this volume, learning books on understanding what anger is, how to control it, and take that into practical effect. A lot of times we don't realize what arrogance is. And we think, you know, I'm working on arrogance. And realize, we, you know, we're completely fell through on the whole aspect of it. arrogance. You know, we completely misunderstood the concept. So we have to learn about it and then work about it. It's not enough that people decide that they're just going to go and work it. And by the way, that's even for tzniut. Somebody who wants to work on tzniut, it's not enough to just say, okay, fine, I'm just going to dress more modestly. It's great that you should, but you should also understand the foundation behind it. You should understand the reason why you do it. You should understand what is tzniut. People think tzniut is just covering certain areas of your body. It's not all that. It's how you talk, how you interact, how, what, you know, what you do in public. There's so many different aspects to it that people think, okay, I fixed this already. And meanwhile, you fix part of it, but there's a big chunk of it that you're missing. So that's where it comes into play that you should go and you should learn about it, you should study about it, you should look into things, and then from that, take it. And if that doesn't work, okay, so let's look for something else. Good, any other questions? No? No, no questions? I feel sometimes people just do a lot more than actually working praying or actually working themselves or talking or 
Like, oh, Skulot is easier. And it's a magic button and then boom. And yeah, boom again. it happens to be that Skulot are much easier than changing my character trait. I, you know, say Shei Al Shirim, you know, 40 days straight, or, you're gonna get mad you know, do Tikkun Aklali for 40 days straight, whatever it is, you think that's <laughs> the great, you know, and, it, and I'm, not ta- I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, you should definitely do it, no, but so there is, there's different aspects to it. The Vilna Gaon says that we're in this world to go and fix our character traits, so we definitely, that's, that's something that's super important, especially people that w- are looking for Skulot to get married. Uh, my favorite saying is, don't look for the right one, become the right one. So you go and you start looking to see, oh yeah, that's, I want, per- no. You work on you being perfect and then let the perfect guy come to you. Be like, oh, no, that guy, he's gonna be, because I need this, and then I need, and then I need my suitcase of stuff, and then I have all this stuff that I'm looking for. And meanwhile, you don't deserve anything, you know? No offense, or take offense, or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. I'm saying like, you, like you, you, have, so many, you have so many faults and that. You, why, would a, why would somebody who has such an air, uh, arrogant issue, anger issue, um, you know, midot um, issue, should deserve a guy that's a sweetheart? Why? That, isn't that, that doesn't seem like it's fair. So work on yourself, become the perfect person. Bezal Hashem, Hashem will send you the perfect man. Oh, here we have another question up here. No, we have more than one question. Okay, let's uh, look, uh, how do we scroll up here? Okay, no, it's still recording. How do you know if something is Mida's problem or a mental disorder? That's a good question. That you have to speak to somebody. That's something that you're not going to know yourself. So either speak to a rabbi, and the rabbi might even say to speak to a therapist to, you know, to clarify that. Sometimes it's a mental disorder. But even if it's a mental disorder, it should still be taken care of. So uh, you know, it might be more difficult, uh, but it should still be taken care of. Okay, next question is, uh, any suggestions on how to control our thoughts to be more modest and pure? When you're used to thinking a certain way for years, it's very hard to change the way of thinking. The more that you learn Torah, that will purify your thoughts. That's number one. So learn a lot of Torah that will um, listen to lectures if you can't, uh, if you can't read, you can't, learn, you can't uh, look inside and read books. And uh, fill, your, fill your time with these things. Don't, don't fill your time with nonsense. Fill your time with, the, with Kiddushah and that will clear uh, your thoughts. Also, the Shemesh Mol brings down on Shavuot that... Um, the Mamal Shavuot, that if you go and you work on your actions, that will fix your thoughts. Because one thing we could control is our actions. We can't control our thoughts. So we could control our actions. If we control our actions, that will spill over to our thoughts. What is controlling our actions? So when you do mitzvot, you control. You do it to the full level of possible. So you're doing Shabbat, you're doing, uh, kosher, you're doing whatever it is. You know, all the mitzvot that you're able to do, you focus on the actions, that will spill over also to the to your thoughts. Wait, specifically on Shavuot? Or just like no, that, he, that's where he brings it down. Oh. I'm just quoting the source. Yeah. Okay, good, good. No more questions. Okay. Hazakabo, can I get Bobby, one of you guys to uh, stop recording that one? It's the red button. <laughs>